apparent arguments being made in favor of movement unity. Essentially, the argument put forth by Johnson is that it is wrong to critique homosexuals because that is bad for movement unity, when in fact the apologetic itself purposefully attacks Christians, a very numerically substantial element of our movement, as Jewish. In such a manner, our erstwhile architects of unity are in fact the cause of disunity, not merely by their very presence but by the divisive nature of their own arguments. Given what we have discussed thus far, it should be clear that if we had to choose between Christians and pseudo-pagan homosexuals, our movement would be numerically, demographically, tactically, socially, and intellectually enriched by choosing the former over the latter. We should also consider modern Jewish attitudes, and what Jews are promoting to us today, rather than what they preached to themselves thousands of years ago. It goes without saying that a people engaged in ethnic warfare would arm itself with the best tools possible while simultaneously weakening the opposing tribe. Jews chose to arm themselves with social mores designed to boost their numbers, but what they did preach to their opponents. Until the late 19th century the Jewish interaction with European culture was more or less limited to financial matters. This changed with the intrusion of the Jews into the mass media and from there the further intrusion into almost every arm of culture. If culture is understood as the way in which a nation speaks to itself about itself, then one must understand that the presence of an alien body in this process can be devastating. The Jews posed themselves as French, German, British, etc. and began to speak to these peoples, not as Jews, but as one of their own. The cultural conversation thus took on a different light altogether, and with different end goals. Without realizing it, these nations were no longer speaking to themselves about themselves, but were instead being fed fabrications by outsiders, both about themselves and about the world. A nation's dreams and aspirations became its nightmares and self-recriminations. A nation that once talked to itself about its future now talked to itself incessantly about its putatively guilty past. As Jews flooded the medical and scientific professions in the late 19th century, they brought with them the desire to interrupt the European self-conversation about race, biology, and related subjects. One of these was homosexuality. In this area, and for the last century or more, Jewish activists have distinguished themselves by normalizing and promoting homosexuality, and by campaigning for cultural and legal changes on behalf of homosexuals. Many of these Jewish activists originated in Orthodox communities where homosexuality was outlawed, but they nevertheless preached toleration of homosexuality to non-Jews. Albert Mall. 1862-1939, who would go on to be a great influence on Freud, came from a Polish-Jewish merchant family and belonged to the Jewish religious community. Typical of his ethno-religious group, Maul frequently utilized his position within the field of medical psychology to form an oppositional bloc against prevailing opinions in 19th and early 20th century non-Jewish society. Indeed, large numbers of Jews tactically ambushed several medical disciplines during this period for precisely this reason. Historian Elena McEnany writes that Jews flooded medicine at this time not only for social standing but also in an era that witnessed the efflorescence of race science, for the opportunity of self-representation, the presence of Jews in the medical sector in general, and in race science in particular, allowed them to assert Jewish equality and very often moral superiority. With Berlin as the center of German medicine, and Jews comprising one-third of doctors in the city, the domination and reorientation of entire disciplines was not only feasible but disturbingly easy. A key aspect of advocating for Jewish equality and moral superiority was the Jewish advocacy of social, racial and religious pluralism, which came to include sexual pluralism. This position often came into conflict with non-Jewish efforts to promote nationalism, particularly ethnically based nationalism, and corresponding efforts to confront social and cultural decay. A universal theme in Albert Mall's works were arguments against German attempts to reckon with late imperial and Weimar-era social and biological degeneration via eugenic programs. For example, in his Handbuch der Sexualwissenschaften, 1911, Mall expressed the hope that mooted plans for sterilization programs would not be implemented and that our race improvers do not get too much influence on our legislation. When German science in the late 1920s became concerned with degeneration and decline, gravitating even further towards eugenics, Mall preceded Boas in rejecting the findings of behavior genetics, arguing that the fact we find so many valuable people, despite the hereditary burden, is caused by regeneration in countless cases, we can hardly ever say something about the condition of offspring with any certainty at all. Mal was, therefore, the quintessential Jewish physician, political and ethnic interests were never far from his dubious practice of medicine. Mal worked tirelessly to persuade leading non-Jewish scholars like Richard von Croft Ebbing to reject the idea that sexual abnormality was the result of biological and psychological disorder. In Freud, biologist of the mind, 
Frank J. Sullaway writes that Croft Ebbing's decision around the turn of the century to separate the doctrine of degeneration from the theory of homosexuality was in response to the thinking of his younger and more critical colleague Maul. However, there is a significant reason to doubt the validity of Croft Ebbing's personal change of perspective given that the most pertinent, later, editions of his Psychopathia Sexualis that showcase this change were in fact edited by none other than Maul himself. Maul's work centered on the argument that there were alternative, valid, identities, and as such, he argued that homosexuality was a valid sexual identity. Whereas earlier non-Jewish psychiatrists observed unsavory and often contemptible personal characteristics among sexual inverts, including their tendency to be liars, their moodiness, love of gossip, and vanity and envy, Mall argued instead that homosexual men were not corrupt, but merely womanish, comprising a kind of third sex, a theory that would later be advanced much further by co-ethnic Magnus Hirschfeld. In Sex, Freedom and Power in Imperial Germany, 1880-1914, E. R. Dixon remarks that Maul's theories were popularized and given substantial sympathetic coverage in Germany by the predominantly Jewish social democratic press during the trial of Oscar Wilde in England in 1895. Re. The Contemporary Scene, see my Occidental Observer colleague Brenton Sanderson's Jewish media influence as decisive in creating a positive public culture of homosexuality. Dixon writes that public policy towards homosexuality was also one more issue social democrats could use to point to the hypocrisy of bourgeois sexual mores and to elaborate on their own naturalist alternative. Social democrat Edward Bernstein, for example, did precisely that in his reporting for German audiences on the Wild case in London, where he was living as a journalist. 8. Even more radical than Maul was Magnus Hirschfeld, 1868-1935. Like Maul, Hirschfeld came from a family of Jewish merchants and, also like Maul, he advanced theories of social and sexual behavior amounting to the existence of fundamentally irreducible sameness in human beings. Unsurprisingly, Elena McEnany writes that Hirschfeld's Jewishness was a socially and politically determinant aspect of his life. A common feature of his work was the hatred he had for Christianity, a hatred both Jewish and homosexual in origin. Indeed, his critique of that religion resembled in many respects the concocted by Freud. To Hirschfeld, Christianity was essentially sadomasochistic, delighting in the pain of ascetic self-denial. Western civilization had thus been in the grip of anti-hedonist exaggerations for 2,000 years, thereby committing psychic self-mutilation. It was, therefore, Western society, rather than homosexuals and other outsiders, that was sick and degenerate, and Hirschfeld's prescribed cure was one destined to be demographically destructive, the promotion of sexual hedonism and the acceptance of a wide array of identities and sexualities. Hirschfeld, described by Mancini as cosmopolitan to the core, essentially created the first homosexual communities, beginning in Berlin where the Hebrew transvestite, a term he coined, was known as Aunt Magnesia by the city's perverts. Hirschfeld organized homosexuals, encouraging them to openly flaunt their predilections and to get involved in the growing campaign for emancipation that was developing under the auspices of the Scientific Humanitarian Committee which he had formed in 1897. Hirschfeld pioneered modern social justice warrior tactics by urging celebrities and high-profile politicians to add their names in support of the campaign for sexual equality. Hirschfeld and his protégés also produced a vast number of books, manuscripts, papers, and pamphlets concerning sexuality, transvestitism, transgenderism, another Hirschfeld term, and fetishes. Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Science, Institut for Sexualwissenschaft was the world's first gender identity clinic and his staff performed the first known transsexual surgeries. Through the Institute for Sexual Science which he founded in 1919, Hirschfeld also documented thousands of cases of sexual inversion and further bolstered his theory of the third sex. Despite the bankruptcy of his science, the dramatic success of the committee at mobilizing large sectors of German and European society on behalf of homosexuals was due to Hirschfeld's personality. Like Maul, he was an aggressive and relentless agitator. Respecting few social codes, he was the darling of the Social Democrats and the reviled enemy of Weimar conservatives, Hitler referred to Hirschfeld as the most dangerous Jew in Germany. By the end of the 1920s, Hirschfeld's activism meant that Weimar Germany saw homosexuality less as a medical disorder and sign of degeneration than as a major cause celebre. Hirschfeld's perverse bonanza came to an end in 1933 when on May 6 nationalist German student organizations and columns of the Hitler Youth attacked the Institute for Sexual Science. The Institute Library was liquidated and its contents used in a book burning on May 10. The youths also printed and disseminated posters bearing Hirschfeld's face complete with the caption, Protector and Promoter of Pathological Sexual Aberrations, also in his physical appearance probably the most disgusting of all Jewish monsters. Hirschfeld himself had been on an international speaking tour since 1931. 
He lived in exile in France until he died of a heart attack in 1935. But unfortunately, this individual enjoyed significant posthumous success. In terms of theory, Hirschfeld had subverted the notion that romantic love should be orientated toward reproduction, arguing instead for the acceptance of homosexual lifestyles and hedonistic, non-reproductive, sexual relations in general. Hirschfeld's use of the weaponized concept of love was itself a legacy of Hirschfeld's scientific mentor and co-ethnic Ewan Bloch, 1872-1922. Like Mahl and Hirschfeld, Bloch had no background in zoology, evolutionary studies or animal behavior. Trained as a dermatologist, Bloch was also attracted to the cause of sexual minorities and became an ardent campaigner on their behalf. He joined with Mahl and Hirschfeld in attacking the non-Jewish consensus that sexual inversion was pathological and coined the term sexualwissenschaft or sexology to give academic and medical respectability to what was essentially a Jewish intellectual reaction against non-Jewish efforts to categorize harmful social and sexual pathologies. He was also a keen promoter of perversion and pornography. He was the discoverer of the Marquis de Sade's manuscript of the 120 Days of Sodom, which had been believed to be lost, and published it under the pseudonym Eugene Duren in 1904. In 1899 he had published Marquis de Sade, his life and works under the same pseudonym. In 1906 he wrote The Sexual Life of Our Time and Its Relations to Modern Civilization, for which he gained the praise of Sigmund Freud for attacking bourgeois, non-Jewish, sexual mores, attacking the perception of sexual inverts as pathological, and calling for Europeans to adopt a more pluralistic and hedonistic sexual life. By the time Mahl, Hirschfeld and Bloch had essentially co-opted and redirected the study of human sexual behavior, Jews were flooding the new discipline in increasing numbers. Albert Uhlenberg, 1840-1917, with a background in neurology and electrotherapy, began styling himself a sexologist. With Bloch and Max Marcuse, 1877-1963, he co-edited the Zeitschrift für Sexualwissenschaft, Journal for Sexology, and with Hirschfeld, he co-founded the Berlin Society for Sexual Science and Eugenics. The eugenics aspect of the society's name was, of course, a clever piece of deception, intended to ingratiate it with non-Jewish eugenic societies for the purposes of eventual subversion with Jewish oppositional ideas. Nor was the tactic new. Uhlenberg, Hirschfeld, and Mahl all claimed to be eugenicists but, like the Jewish-dominated German League for Improvement of the People and the Study of Heredity, astute nationalists perceived the attempt at co-option from within, and all were attacked by National Socialist publisher Julius F. Lehmann as part of a targeted subversion on the part of Berlin Jews. 14. Although Jewish sexology, and with it the promotion of homosexuality, was effectively shut down by the National Socialists, it would live on in exile, along with other poisonous doctrines, with the Frankfurt School. After the war, it would return, with Horkheimer and Adorno, to Frankfurt, where the Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Science would be re-established and then led by their protege Volkmar Sieg, who coined the term cisgender, now much beloved by SJWs. From there it would spread throughout the West. Since taking on the leadership of the Institute, Sieg has acted as a theorist and expert on social policy issues, and he has played a key role in liberalizing Germany's laws penalizing homosexuality. Until 2006, Sieg led Frankfurt University's Institute for Sexual Science and its associated sexual medicine clinic. In 2005, he published Neosexuality, on the cultural change of love and perversion. In early March 2011, he released Searching for Sexual Freedom. Sieg, who has done much to continue the advance of sexual pluralism, has been described by Der Spiegel as one of the main thinkers behind the sexual revolution of the 1960s. Despite his non-Jewish ethnicity, these works reveal that he is the spiritual and ideological son of Mahl, Bloch, Hirschfeld, and Uhlenberg. Yet more reasons, perhaps, to question the argument, advanced by countercurrents, that homophobia is Jewish. The promotion of homosexuality within white nationalism. One might be tempted to dismiss the position of countercurrents on the homosexual question as merely wrong-headed, ill-informed, or even amateurish. However, I believe that many of the writers there are intelligent, historiographically literate, and are probably aware that they are producing an argument with an agenda attached. One of the more annoying aspects of their position, however, is that it is framed under the rubric that homosexuality is beside the point. Even if this were true, which in terms of our demographic and social concerns it is not, countercurrents have not stuck to their professed line. In fact, through the publication of volumes such as James O'Mara's The Homo and the Negro, and a number of articles acting as apologetics for homosexuality, they've done quite the opposite. I only very recently looked at the homo and the negro for the first time and was stunned at the publication, by an ostensibly nationalist organization, of a set of writings that promotes pederasty. In the homo and the negro Omera advances a number of arguments that should now be familiar, 
and with which we have already dealt with. O'Mara writes of the futility of the right due to its Judeo-Christianity.